Luckily, you prepared for this by having everything but camp songs this morning already. So uh, maybe we should start by singing a song, and then it'll go easier. Uh, okay, so by the promise, Acorn is a membership-based organization of low and moderate income families. That's how we were in the United States. That's how we are in 17 countries around the world. So the model, I'll go through it, and some of you I've seen before in London and elsewhere, and I went through pieces of the model. It's based on uh, very intensive work at the grassroots level. We also organize uh, in both communities and labor situations because increasingly uh, in the modern world we live in, it's very difficult to distinguish people's work from the rest of their lives. Many people work where they live and live where they work, particularly in places like India, um, that's the way it evolves. Okay, what's next? So here's what we have in Acorn International now. We have 100,000 dues-paying members. The great bulk of those are in Canada, where we've worked for the last 10 years. But it also includes things like we have 10,000 members of uh, a union in Bengaluru, which uh, you may know as Bangalore, India, which are hawkers, street vendors, food vendors, uh, dock workers, security workers. And we have another 2,000 similar workers in Delhi. So I'm sure you'll ask me before the end of the 90 minutes, how do you reconcile having unions with informal workers as well as community-based members? And we'll get to that. So here's where we are in the world. Here's where our newest affiliate is here in Bristol. You'll hear more about that, Edinburgh. We started, obviously, in the United States. We have four offices in Canada. We work extensively in Latin America, Ecuador, Peru, and Lima, Mexico City, Dominican Republic, La Matanza outside of Buenos Aires, Tegucigalpa, San Pedro Sula, and Honduras. We work in Latin America largely in what are known as mega slums. So we don't work so much in the city of Lima as we work in San Juan La Ardancho, which is a mega slum of about one and a half, two million people. La Matanza is right in the provincia of Buenos Aires, and that's also a very large slum. We work in Korogochu, which is the second largest slum in Kenya, in Nairobi, really. Obviously, we work throughout Delhi, Mumbai, Bengaluru. We have partnerships in Indonesia, Korea, and the Philippines. We have an affiliate uh, in Rome, Prague. It all adds up to 16, 17 countries, depending on how you go on the Scotland, England thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go. I just wait, you know, see how the votes count out. So, that's the list. Now we're picking up steam. How do you put all these people together? Each, this Acorn International, as opposed to Acorn in the U.S. or Acorn England, is a federation. What's a federation? Well, of people who have members, membership in common. Well, actually, it's, it's autonomous groups. organizations that are linked together. So, a federation, like labor federations, like the TUC here, or the... CLC in Canada, or the FLCIO, or federations. In other words, they're combinations of independently autonomous unions that are responsible for their own business that link together for various reasons, political or organizational, or whatever. So you can imagine 17 countries, the laws <coughs> in all those countries are different. You can't have one organization. For, for example, ACORN would never be able to register in India because it's foreign. So yet you can have an ACORN in India or an Acorn Trust as we're registered there, and federate to Acorn International. So each country in their own country creates their own bylaws, comes together. So what do we come together on? Of course, we come together on campaigns, because the local issues might be different in Dharavi in the middle of Mumbai than they are in uh, Houston, Texas, or in Bristol. What has brought us together on campaigns particularly over the last couple of years, and Acorn International is now about a dozen years old, are things like rem the remittance justice campaign. People are familiar with remittances. Remittances are money transfers, particularly from migrant workers and immigrant families, back to their families and home communities. It adds up in Latin America sometimes to the second, third, or in El Salvador, even the first largest part of the, general, of the GNP. The problem with remittances is that it's a predatory financial mechanism most times, which makes billions and billions of dollars for banking institutions and money transfer organizations like MoneyGram and Western Union, 
basically because countries don't care if you steal from migrants and from immigrant families, many of whom are not citizens. So the fact that banks that are domiciled here, whether it's HSB or RBC or whatever, or in the U.S., are stealing immigrants blind doesn't really matter. There is a World Bank protocol, and the G8 has agreed that the costs have to go down to 5% of remittances. How do you reckon they think that's going to happen? Banks, World Bank, all these countries. Just take a guess. Competition. It's going, to, it's going to be competition. It's going to be the invisible hand of Adam Smith that somehow brings those rates down, convinces the banks, why do you really need to take 23, 25% from somebody's remittance from here to Kenya? I mean, come on. You can do, you can do better. You know, so we have a campaign that says you have to do better. Um, I'll go into that at some other time. Digital divide, we all know what that is, right? There's, People are on, on the internet. Many people believe it's a basic utility, like lights, gas, whatever. Other people, most people in the world still aren't on. In a city like New Orleans, where I live, more than 50% of the community doesn't have access. And that's the whole community, the whole city. Obviously, in a low and moderate income community, it's even higher. It doesn't have access to a computer or the internet. Cost, and even Canada and the US, are controlled by monopolies, so they're very high. We're trying to link this. If, you're, if we're organizing in Kenya, people say, well, how can you organize internationally now? And you say, well, you know, there is the internet. That helps. Email allows communication. You couldn't have done that by packets on boats, clearly. Skype means you can actually have conversations with people on a regular basis. Here becomes the problem. In a place like Kenya, all the internet is metered. So, you want 10 minutes, you might have to put up, uh, on the computer, you might have to put up a Kenya shilling. A whole hour, if you were doing research on a campaign, many of you wouldn't think twice about going up on the computer for an hour, checking this, that, and the other out, maybe spending a little time on your Facebook, you know, doing this, whatever, you know, networking. In Kenya, our organizers go up for three minutes. They, you know, do the draft, the emails, boom, let those emails come out. So, in fact, the notion of surfing on the internet how they would research you in basic campaigns is so expensive it's very difficult for them. And that's our organizers. People in the rest of Korogochu have no access. So maybe there's an internet cafe, but it's a, it's a profit making thing. This is an interesting campaign. We've actually made some progress in the US and Canada. We've got several companies to agree to a $10 a month internet package and to provide computers, you know, that are refurbished. Uh, well, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Remittances. Regulate bank fees now. That's an example of the campaign. The other one was landlord-tenant relationships. Turns out that issue is almost everywhere. Rome, that's the biggest part of what we do. Toronto, that's been a huge issue for the last 10 years. Bristol, it turns out to be a huge issue. Edinburgh, where we have our affiliate, the Edinburgh Private Tenants Action Group, and it's working there and in Glasgow. So one of the things that's been interesting now in working in all these countries is we're starting to now uh, look at the regulations in all of those communities, how they work, what's working, why a complaint-based system never works to regulate landlords, how they want $100 million in repairs with ACORN in Toronto, why they're not happy, how they would like that level of repairs to be won in Bristol, what makes them happier. Uh, so it turns out you can even take very local campaigns and make them national. And for those of you in London, I mean, I've often mentioned that if we could ever figure out a global way to solve these three issues, anybody may remember, loose dogs, drainage, and how to pick up trash, we pretty much have a people's organization that could run the world. But I know y'all don't want to get serious yet. Okay, more remittance justice. Let's do actions on them. Okay, landlord tenants. I actually skipped over one. How do we put people together? Hey, you even know how to door knock, right? Home visits, personal contact. That's not to say we're anti-internet, obviously. These are people doing the work. Yeah. 
Here's our operation in India. We run, uh, as part of what we do in the neighborhoods where we organize and among some of the workers, we also end up running shelters in a partnership with the Municipal Corporation of Delhi for some of our members that are rickshaw pullers or auto rickshaw drivers and others who don't have, who end up frequently not having a place to stay or live in the slum. So this is a night facility for uh, migrant and men workers. This is a campaign we're involved in in Rome. Here's our head organizer there, David Tasso, in the office there. We won, we've been exploiting an issue where if you turn in a landlord who's been operating on the gray side, which means they haven't recorded their property for taxes, through a unique loophole we found in a law in Italy, if the tenant turns in that landlord successfully and registers the property, they pay a small amount of back taxes, but essentially for the period of an Italian lease, you get a rent reduction to only pay 10 to 15 percent of what your rent was. So if you were paying a thousand euros, I don't want to mass shame anybody, but you'd only be paying like 100 or 150 euros a month. And what's the period of an Italian lease, you reckon? I know leases in Bristol are very short, aren't they? Yeah. Six months or something? Ridiculous. Well, what do you reckon they are in Italy? Five years. Who's at five years? Okay, let's go with five years. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, okay, well now we're having some fun. Four years is the base lease and the tenant gets a four-year option to renew, so it's eight years. So if you did the math, if you're saving, let's say, $800 a year for eight years, that's roughly, you know, 10000 bucks. So then you put a landlord on the tenant. Gee, sorry. But the landlord was basically against the state. They weren't paying taxes on that property. So the state passed the Italian parliament. So the tenants live in that property, and the landlord that knows what you have done, and things can be... They don't live together. No, but things can be uncomfortable, so, you know... Right, you have to decide whether you're going to have, save 80,000 euros or whether or not you're going to make your landlord happy. That, that is, you're right. That is, no, that's exactly right. And we have that conversation with lots of people. So you would think, oh, I bet students jump all over this. No, students don't touch this because they figure, hey, I'm only here for a year or two. It's a wink and nod. They'll look, you know, the landlord will give me a 10% reduction. I just won't get in trouble. So it's working families who can't afford those rents. We're still trying to live in Rome, Milan, Palermo, wherever. And what you're saying is, and what I'm saying is, I don't organize landlords. That's what I'm saying. He's not getting any rent for now. Oh, he is getting rent. No, not getting enough. Maybe he's depending on his situation. If he can't pay his mortgage, the, the property goes back to whoever, then everyone's out. And the tenant hasn't got. You know, so the property then becomes non valuable if that tenant keeps that right of all them years. Who's going to buy that property to keep the tenant in on such low rent at the price? I guess, I, guess he's I guess we're not going to talk about this right now. Now, if we have more, <laughs> no, I mean this is fair enough, but this is not a discussion on landlord rights. I'm just saying what we do. I'm just saying what we do. You may disagree with lots of it. I just appreciate that. I'm trying to make enough time at the end so we can have a longer discussion on these things. But if all of a sudden we get into the deep weeds on how landlord-tenant relationships work in Rome, we're never going to get to what you're interested in. So I'm not trying to cut you off, but I am trying to postpone you. Maybe it's a little catch up. Fair enough? I should have told you all. I'm not a consultant. I'm not a trainer. I'm an organizer. So I was clear with you about my agenda. And I'm a landlord. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to tell me. I actually knew that. Just, I don't know how. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. You worry about the market. Everything, something comes to you. Okay. Okay. In India, this is what some of our meetings look like. It's sort of interesting work. There, we originally started on a campaign to stop the modification of foreign direct investment in India, and not let Tesco, Walmart, Metro, others come in.
<laughs> Come for that, help Come. you. <laughs> Cheers, for that. See? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that one. There you go. Get that arrow over here to the next. Press escape. I'd like to thank my lovely assistant. Hey! Okay, Ecuador. Here's what it looks like. Okay. Here's what Edinburgh looks like. Here's one of the first meetings. That's their banner. Here's one of their actions. Gas prices, too high. I'm sure there are people here who own gas companies who want to take it. <laughs> Once again, fair is fair, just like I told the landlord brother. After, there's going to be a time for the, land, for the gas owners to... Here's some of the very able door-knocking team. You know, the classic... This is Bristol representing. Huh? This is Bristol representing. Oh, is this Bristol? Is, uh, okay, I'm, I'm now into Bristol. Here's the first meeting of Bristol uh, Acorn Group in Easton. Good crowd, 100 people. You'll hear more about that, and we'll talk about it. Here's some actions in Canada, just to give you a feel of what people really do who are ACORN members and who want to get something done. Here's where they want a washroom at the uh, tenant offices. I don't know why. Here's where they wanted uh, in Ottawa. It gets cold in Ottawa. It's not lovely like here. And here's where they want to uh, get work orders to do repairs, once again, with those damn landlords. <laughs> Mattress action, that's a little creative. You have to a little, have a little imagination. They're trying to get uh, longer term addiction recovery centers. So they're basically trying to pick the point that people are in flop houses, just shooting up. You know, it's an issue. So, how do we build this model? Over the 38 years, I founded ACORN June 18, 1970. Yes, I should have asked for a happy birthday thing here. It was just the other day, 44 years. You know, it didn't occur to me to make a fool of myself and have everybody sing. You don't really know me well. 38 years, we wanted to build a model. And what is an organizing model? What is a model at all? Let's just stop with some of the confusion people are having about organizing. What is a model? Just think about it as a word. It's a way of doing things. It's a way of doing things. So, say what? Okay. Well, all those things are true, but a model is also something that works. Okay? I mean, it's not a model if it falls apart. It's a model is something that demonstrably can be replicated. A model is something where you can predict the results. Now, if we talk about an organizing model, you're talking about something that Rob could do, something that Nick could do, something that Paulette could do, and you could, it might it'd be different in every place, it's different in Mumbai or New Orleans or, you know, London, but within some frame of, you know, the difference is a matter of degree, it's not a fundamental one. If you do the basic work of an organizing model, you can say something will happen. So the one thing we know about the ACORN organizing model is there will always be a community organization that emerges at the end of it. If you do those pieces between 10 and 12 weeks that you need to do to build that group, you will have a group. Now, we can't predict that you'll do hard work or that you'll have a great committee or that you'll win the first campaign. Those things are all variables. But if you do a reasonable amount of those tasks that go into the model, you can predict there will be a group. It'll have 100 people at the first meeting, maybe it'll have 50, maybe it'll have 250. First meeting in Kenya had 350. <coughs> Some of the first meetings in India are huge, but they have, you know, there's a different kind of cultural dynamic that, dr that drives organization in some of these places. But a model, nothing is a model that isn't replicable. Nothing is a model that you can't predict within some level what the, what the area of success will be. And a lot of people throw words like models, movements, etc. out like they were candy. 
those, those, they're really hard. But I don't want to get off the subject. Our model focused on low and moderate income people. We don't, as, as I told my friend here, we don't organize the rich. We don't organize businesses. We don't organize landlords. We organize low and moderate income families. They happen to be a lot of people. They're the majority, in fact, of almost every community that we've ever seen. We try to build mass-based organizations, not small organizations. We don't organize clubs. We organize groups as big as they can possibly get. We're membership-based for two reasons. One, because we believe in a democratic organization where members are led. I keep getting confused when you all talk about volunteers. A volunteer is somebody who helps yeah, us yeah. organize. A leader is somebody who's a member in our system who's elected as a leader. And I gather when you all talk about volunteers, those are somewhere between leaders, members, and volunteers. I'm not really sure. Maybe? Okay. So, direct action, you know, what, you know what direct action is, in other words, you saw pictures from Canada, when people have an issue, try to deal with the campaign, they will keep accelerating the level of actions in that campaign persistently over time until they win. Multi-issue, we're not just a tenants group, we're not just an income maintenance group, we're not just a housing group, we're a group that deals with the democratic issues that are approved by those local groups. We're, we were rare starting in 1971-2 um, in that we were a non-profit, we were not tax exempt, and the reason was we never wanted there to be barriers on what our membership could democratically decide. So the notion that an organizer would have to get up in the back of the room once members said, well, you know, the mayor's not giving us what we need, or the governor's not doing what we need, so we're going to oppose him at the next election. To have to get up in the back of the room and say, oh, gee, you know, I hear what you're saying, but Acorn can't do that. So we didn't do that. They went, oh! <laughs> I've learned one thing. Uh, so we... There are no boundaries, in other words, for the Acorn membership. If they wanted to get involved in politics, boom, they were in politics. If they wanted to, uh, you know, build a housing corporation, boom, they did that. If they wanted to organize labor unions, boom, they did that. In coordinated autonomy, that's the way Acorn International works. It's also the way Acorn in the U.S. works. Each group within their jurisdiction has 100% autonomy to make a decision based on its members. Once they need help from the other groups, let's say if you wanted to, in Easton and Bristol, they can do whatever they need to in Easton. But if you have to bring an issue to the Bristol Council, you may need other groups, once they're organized, to agree with you. Then you have to coordinate. Then you have to have an overwhelming majority of all the groups in that political jurisdiction agree with you. State, national, provincial, whatever it is. Okay? How did it all start? So I started as an organizer when I was 20 years old. That's how you get a lot of years in. You figure out what you're going to do, find out that you're not too bad at it, just keep on moving. And it's really something you have to do every day. Um, so I started when I was 20 years old in Massachusetts, which is a state up in the New England area of uh, the United States, and organized welfare recipients. Those are people, I guess you would say, on the dole. These were mainly women with children who were on a program called Aid to Families with Dependent Children. And we believe the radical thing that you had a right to welfare. It was in the law, you had a right. If the law said it, let's get it, you know? Acorn, boom! Okay, here's where it started, 1970. First time I ever went to New York to try to raise a little extra money was in 1974, and the first time I walked into a funder's office, she had to ask the secretary to come show her a map and tell her where the hell Arkansas was. You know, that's that kind of state, it's not big. It's two and a half million then, now it's about three and a half million. It's in what's called the southern part of the United States. The nice thing about it was for building what I was building, Little Rock was the capital, which is where we started, it was the center of the state, and also the capital, which meant it had political jurisdiction. And it was a poor state. A lot of issues we dealt with ran that way. 1970, 1980, in five years, we decided to expand to 20 states where we were organizing within 80 years. With them by 1980. <laughs> As we wanted to expand, once we started expanding in 1975 out of Arkansas, because there started to be a demand from other people to do the same issues we were involved in, just as we've done internationally, 
We wanted in the 1980 presidential election to be able to demand on all the candidates for the United States presidency that they had to create programs to benefit low and moderate income families. So by 1980, this is where we were. We started in Arkansas, went to the rest of the southern states, other than Mississippi and Alabama, went west. Not so much at that, that time in the New England area or in the Midwest. That's some of what it looked like. There are a lot of organizations that became part of the family of Acorn organizations. And there are 600 community organizations that were in every one of the states. You probably can't see, but the only states we didn't get to by the time I left were uh, not enough people lived in the Upper West and Plain States, and the New England area is just boring to me. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I know. Uh, I mean, we organized in Massachusetts and Connecticut, but like the Maines and New Hampshire's, uh, I really don't know what happens up there, but there aren't that many people, so. I'm sorry. Okay, this is some of what we do. These are actions at various state capitals. There's San Diego, there's D.C. We also ended up organizing labor unions starting in 1980. We organized 880 in Chicago, Local 100 in New Orleans. This is a campaign we organized to stop Walmart expansion, and we organized Walmart workers into a, a labor association in the U.S. Okay, here's the convention. We organized three radio stations. We still operate uh, KBF in Arkansas. It's 100,000 watts. Soon there's going to be a Bristol show, a Scotland show, and one in Dallas and one in Tampa. We got a housing corporation. 8,000 people got new homes every year. Home ownership, we had 35 offices around the country. Did 50,000 taxes a year, saving people $20 million a year by the time I left. So why do you build a big organization like H1? Because it really is easier to polish the pearl in one neighborhood. You know, just burrow into that neighborhood, build a a lot of civic awareness, build a good membership in one neighborhood. And you can imagine a lot of people have always said to me, why not just go deeper in that one neighborhood? Why spend all this time, energy, and resources to try to build national and international organizations? Those are good questions. We're going to actually spend some time on these questions. But let's look at why ACORN did it in the U.S. So, for example, living wage campaigns. We did 150 living wage campaigns. I've actually met at different times with citizens here about living wage campaigns, so there is some understanding of what a living wage campaign is. It's an attempt to force wages, minimum wages, to go up for workers, right? Mm -hmm. There are two ways to do that. One is through contracts, or what are called prevailing wage agreements. The other is geographically, to try to get all the wages in an area to go up. We actually like the second better, trying to get increases for entire cities, counties, or states. So we actually, by 2006, were putting minimum wage propositions on the ballot in a number of states. Uh, and just looking at four of those states where we won those propositions, Ohio, Colorado, Arizona, and Missouri, here's the vote count. Can anybody read this? So we kicked their ass. That's an American expression, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if you get the opportunity to use that expression much in your work, but it's an important, yeah, I can't tell you how good it feels. Um, so, Ohio, they fought us cats and dogs, boom, we got 2 million votes. Colorado, 753%. Arizona, Arizona's a very conservative state, bam, two-thirds of the vote. Eat them like a red-haired stepchild, as they used to say to me. Missouri, 1.5 million. Boom, 76% of the votes. That's a landslide. Uh -huh. and what, but it's not just about winning, right? Right? Oh, okay. It's also about the money. So... I, do, I know, and the other thing, I warned you I was not a trainer or a consultant. I actually do this because I have to enjoy myself as well. So I should have warned you. Yeah, okay, okay sister. All right. So Ohio, what does it mean? Total amount people gain every year when we won. How many people? Let me see, I can't even see the damn thing. So the number of workers affected, 446. Let's call them 450,000 people. Boom, they're collecting $1.3 billion cash money. 
from private sector businesses. You understand what I'm saying? Minimum wages mean everybody's wages go up. Arizona, 900 grand almost, 300,000 workers. Missouri, 345,000, 256,000 workers. I'm sorry, Missouri. Colorado, almost 300,000, 500 million. That's one year. Most of those proposals have indexes, so they went up every year. Some of the living wage things we won, we won the first living wage campaign in, outside of New Westminster, outside of Vancouver. We won, the wage was set at 16.23 per hour. It's now up to 18.50 or so, because it's gone up with an escalator on inflation. You know, take the truth, that's serious money for a lot of people. I know it's not pounds, it's dollars. But it's not bad dollars. Housing agreements. We had to fight banks. They did this thing called redlining, which means they wouldn't lend to African Americans, Latinos, low and moderate income families. So in 1978, we and others won what was called a community investment reinvestment uh, agreement. You know, I didn't even realize you were having to draw this on the board. What a thankless job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, props to you, sister. I, you know, wish I could help. <laughs> so what? I'll definitely send you a copy of the PowerPoint. <laughs> you know, if the hand cramps up, I don't want any kind of, you know, carpal tunnel. <laughs> so what did we win? Not just in getting a CRA, because lots of people, 20 million houses were won. What did we win from the agreements we negotiated with banks, like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, big banks, Money Center back to the U.S., you've heard the names. Over 30 years, we got 6 million people houses. Private ownership. I'm not talking about tenants. We're on ownership now. If they averaged only 100000 a year, which is actually pretty low, that's about $600 million worth of homes people got. I don't know. That's not fair. One bank, for example, we beat, you may know, HSBC, HS, yeah, HSBC, I know Hong Kong, but it's actually a British bank, you familiar with it? Yeah. Okay. So they owned a company that just stole from people on interest rates on credit cards and on loans. It used to be called household finance. It was basically a short-term, high-interest loan operation that got into the mortgage business. So we fought a campaign for several years. They were the largest mortgage lender, and they were predatory with their interest rates. We fought them and finally beat them. Their actual settlement to remediate the, the damages was almost a billion dollars, like $700,000. But here's what, in negotiating the final agreement, they tried to buy a civil rights group to basically front for them and say, hey, HSBC is cool so that they didn't have to settle with us. So in part of the settlement I negotiated, they then had to pay twice what they paid to buy somebody off to pimp them for them to us to make sure we were held whole. So for three years, they actually funded us for $2 million a year. Yeah. That's, you know, <laughs> payback. <laughs> Anybody who understands money, you sit there. Up here. <laughs> she wants to have fun and make money. So we believe if you're going to go after them and beat them, collect too. Because it's important to resource the work. I know there's a fundraising workshop that you're missing, maybe because you're here with me. Here's the summary of that workshop if you missed it. Go out and buy a ski mask and see if you can get a gun. Because that's the only sure way people have raising money these days. The rest of it is based on building a membership, winning campaigns, and making sure those resources build your organization. That's just my opinion. I know there's a different gun law here, so you may not have any way to raise money. I don't know. Do <laughs> you have any of these companies, H&R Block, Jackson Hewitt, Liberty, they do taxes for people in the U.S., Canada? Okay. Maybe they collect taxes first year and send you the money later, right? Anyway, they were doing a thing where you went in to get your taxes, they'd give you a refund out right away, but they might charge you three or four hundred percent of interest. So we bought a campaign, beat them, won several million dollars, saved a billion point two, whatever. Just looking at a ten year period, we've had an outside professor look at how our local groups just on different issues won things. And they started adding up just the money monetary benefits, not all the good 
the soft stuff, leaders developed, families, you know, empowered, elections won, you know, that, just, just looking at the money. Predatory lending, four and a half billion. Living wage increases, two billion a year. EITC, that's a tax thing, eight million. Loan counseling, four billion, blah, 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 blah. Eleven billion dollars. That breaks it up more. So why did I go through this? Why are we doing the speed, speed dating thing about what Acorn did? If you build something big, the reason you do it, the reason you don't stay in just one neighborhood and polish the pearl is because you want to win. We had a problem in the United States that they changed the way there was what's called devolution. They changed the way power worked. There was a point where we could have organization in maybe 30 large cities and we could leapfrog right to DC and force there to be change and benefits. But from Ronald Reagan, who was a buddy of your Margaret Thatcher on, there was devolution. They stopped moving money to the cities. They basically tried to, you know, starve cities to death. They didn't care if they lived or died. Those were Republican voters anyway. Those were Democratic voters. And so you had to get, the money went to the states. So we had to then alter our organizing strategy. Maybe it was enough for us to have an office in San Francisco, in Oakland, and LA, and San Diego to be able to leverage California. You have devolution, then you've got to win at the legislative level in campaigns in California first before you get to DC. So then we had to have 13 offices in California. We had to have 11 offices in Texas. We had to have eight offices in Florida. We had to have six offices in Ohio. It meant you had to drastically expand so that we ended up, by the time you saw some of those later victories, having 100 offices around the country, an organizing staff of 1,500. And that also includes the labor organizing staff and the housing people and everybody else. And you ended up with a big organization, but Acorn at that time had a half million members for low moderate income people. And my argument is, why do we do that? What does it all mean? Well, one of the things it meant in a very simple way is that when our membership was attacked or devastated, we had a way to deal with that. And this is why you build a membership organization as opposed to something, you know, more ephemeral. Hurricane Katrina, many people have heard about it. Big, bad thing, hit New Orleans. We had our national headquarters in New Orleans. I still live in New Orleans when I'm there. Well, when I'm there, I live there, whatever you say. Um, so they, 85% of the city flooded. It was particularly had adverse consequences. New Orleans was a, was, is a city at that time. More than two thirds, about close to 70% of the population was African American. It was one of the poorest cities in the country per capita income, it was the top 50. It was at the bottom with Miami. Um, so you probably read, they just sort of washed people around the country, and we still are trying to get 80,000 people back home. But what made a difference in fighting Katrina is having a membership, we actually knew where people were. Now, if we'd been a coalition, we might have known where people went to church or where a minister was relocated or something, but we couldn't have found the members. But as a membership organization, we ended up in the rare position of being where people knew to come if they wanted to rebuild. So we ended up doing, this is a, a house gutting operation. First we had to stop whole neighborhoods from being bulldozed where lower income families live because they wanted to just make housing tracks into green space. And I understand green space is important. It's becoming a big thing, and there's a lot of you know, green. We want, we want things to be green. But not, we don't want things to be green where we live. I mean, we want to live by it, not nowhere near it. And that was their sort of thing. They were going to depopulate the city, particularly in the Lower Ninth Ward. And even now, in the Lower Ninth Ward, August 29th, ninth year, only 20% of the population is back. But we were able to have a huge impact as a membership organization as our members came first to the office to try to save their house, put together what they needed to prove that they could rebuild, get the loans, rebuild their organizations. And the plan that would have not allowed them to build meant you had to elect a mayor and a city council. And of course, we knew not only where our members were, but where they relocated in Houston, Dallas. So we literally had to bring people in buses back from Atlanta, Little Rock, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston to vote in the election to make sure that we were able to rebuild. 
So, why do we do this work? What does it mean to be an organizer? If you listen to what I'm talking about. Make a difference. Make a difference. So it's about, and that difference often has to do with change. Upgrade standard of living. It has to do with citizen wealth, giving people income security, improving their standard of living, because that's one of the things members want. And you know, when people want to improve their standard of living, it's hard to win that at the neighborhood level. Everybody in the neighborhood might say, let's give ourselves a raise. Okay. So what do, you, what do you do then? And you know, you could say, wait, you are crazy. Why didn't you stay in those 32 offices? Why did you have 100 offices in the US? Well, what I know, and I know about this much about how government works in England, but a lot of stuff you can't get done at your neighborhood and city level, can you? You have to go to Westminster, like we would have to go to DC. Well, to do that, this little group we have in Easton, Bristol, what, are they going to be able to jump from Easton over to Westminster and change the way everything about dealing with landlords operates? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe it's, you know, lightning strikes. Everybody will, like, you know, glom onto Bristol. They're cute people. It's a nice town. They like the hills, whatever. You know, Banksy was from around there. So, yeah. <laughs> Miracles do happen, um, but they don't happen much. So what we do, and if you're going to call yourself an organizer, you really have to organize something. And the only thing I know that we do as organizers is organize organizations. I mean, I don't know how you separate the word organizer from organizations. And organizations are important as collective responses to create change. And you can't create change without power. I picked up a booklet, and this is not to be, you know, pejorative at all, about case stories of, of all the work you all do. And of the 20 odd case studies, there are only a couple that really focused on how you win change or power. Yeah, if you've seen this, it's, a, it's actually fascinating. And all of the work that people did was good work. But as, as in a very, irreplaceable resources, community organizers, with a program that isn't going to last forever, not to seize the opportunity to build organizations that might endure past your time as a, uh, you know, I never know what to call you, but as whatever you are, a big society, you know, representative. <laughs> oh, is that wrong? That hurts. That hurts. Was, that, was that low blow? I'm that sorry. Hurts. I'm sorry. And I guess it makes my point. If you want to be an organizer, you have to build organizations. And if organizations are democratic, they're going to want to change. And they're going to want to take action. And they're going to want to build power. And that's why, you know, I'm so excited about this program. I mean, seeing people like Nick and Louie, who are able to, you know, take this resource, their time as organizers, move to the second year and do it. A lot of other people are talking about it. We'd like to encourage, I'd like to encourage all of you, if you have the chance, want to do a second year, want to try to figure out how to deepen your work and build organization and link those organizations together into something like ACORN here in, in England, that would be exciting. But, and I assume some of you are here to learn, you know, what might be something that's not. So, I'm not saying everything you would do is what we did. The issues are bound to be different. Tactics would be different. Political situations would be different. You have a multi-party system. We just have barely any choice at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess maybe you have about the same. Um, but regardless, I mean, so I'm, I don't have any prescription for what you would want to do here, no more than I can tell you what people are doing in India or Argentina or, or Honduras. But I do know that if you build an organization, you have a way to move. What do you think of that? Yeah. Yeah. So what are you doing? Well, um, I'm in London. And, uh, I'm just thinking about when you talk about the international, you know, for me, it's, it's a combination of local plus the my diaspora, particularly my community. And I was just recently at a meeting about the diaspora. Uh, and there's a lot of frustration about the, the lack of the poor communication between the Caribbean diaspora and that of the UK, 
it's politic political. The same. We get that in Canada every Very, day. Yeah. Absolutely, and the remittances, you name it, everything, immigration, you name it, education, frustration about the fact that we study to the same level and student and people have to resit the same exams that we sat that were British in the first place. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just a real crazy thing. So I was just thinking um, the challenges to, I, I, was, I was thinking for more from a community organising perspective that if they, if, if we could organise from a fun, fundamentals of community organising, perhaps we could make better headway in building a template to start this communication and bridge that poor communication and the lack of it or the difficulty and the challenges, etc., between the two uh, regions. Gotcha. It's Anybody else, how do you, how would you link some of what we're talking about with what you're trying to do? How is this helpful? Yeah. Well, I'm only in cohort 12, but the area I'm organizing was the area that I was organizing in to some extent. Um, anyway, and I mean, I just agree with the, the membership dues paying for those same meetings, democracy. In what city are you in? London. London. But, yeah, very much northwest London. Um, and yeah, I just think well, I mean, I've been starting to well, We have a group that is affiliated to the United Community, which is probably the closest thing that exists already. I mean, that's a new initiative, but it's existed for about two years and it's growing quite slowly, but it's probably about 7,000 members. Like, actually, nothing super impressive and no big ticket victories. Such, you know, which is a problem with the model. The right, right. The amount of no, I've never struck me could, right. could have done that by now, really. And I think we're pushing, certainly, the London organisers to get you to come and do training on that. I don't know how, like, I've been sitting here thinking how ACORN and the United Community could work. I mean, there are certainly things about the United Community that have recommended itself to me just because of where it sits in relation to the political and power dynamics of um, this country. But yeah, I think as community organisers, I think we should feel empowered to say, you know, like, we're allowed to sort of promote the vote, we're allowed to promote, do you know what I mean, all sorts of kind of right things. Why is it that we feel like we can't promote actually stable, sustainable organisation? You know, so whether that's ACORN or whatever it is that people right. use. Right, no, I, yeah, I can't say it's a, right, that a barrier right, that exactly. is, so it goes against our model or something. Should. It's in the interest of our community, people will acknowledge that. We've got a long history of membership organizations in our community. No, I was talking to somebody last night who was, uh, you know, telling me about starting fairly freshly as a, an organizer with the program. And, uh, the first couple of things he kept sort of listening as he was supposed to and, and sort of realized that he had to stop waiting for people themselves to organize the next step, the meeting or whatever it was going to be. He had to actually carry his part of the weight as an organizer to support what I call members or people in the neighborhood or community taking that next step to try to make something happen. So, um, but that's part of what I'm talking about. I mean, this is not, you know, a recruitment session for ACORN organizers, but it is, I'd love for people to organize more seriously because that actually helps the work that ACORN organizers do because it's more people building up the same kinds of structure and handling the weight who we can work with as well. I mean, it's impossible to be everywhere, anywhere, whether it's the U.S. or India, or certainly, or, or even the U.K. So the more organizations that are roughly trying to do the same thing, the more chance we have of being able maybe to come together on a campaign or to come together on some kind of issue, or God knows if there's ever a real movement, we're all able to respond. Um, and those things are important. But anybody who does want to come work for ACORN should definitely talk to me. So wait, you've got another battery. Uh, yeah, right um, here. Yo. Yeah, I think you asked me about the kind of how we feel about the wider scale of stuff and how we link that together. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get... Um, yeah. I think the membership funding model is a really interesting one because a lot of people spend a lot of time towards the end of their year trying to figure out how on earth they're going to make this something you can earn a living from. Right. I think for me that's something I would find, it's an exciting idea, but I know I would find it difficult to ask somebody for money, especially somebody who's like struggling to feed their kids. Um, but I'm not saying it's not worth doing, I'm not saying it's not the right, right thing to do, but I think that's the thing I would find the hardest was to ask people for money. 
especially because I know you, we, I was lucky enough to come for the whole day, and you ask a lot of people for, for money in the first 15 minutes. Oh yeah, we get right to it. Very and transparent. I, would, I would want to, I guess, learn how to do that, but I would find that difficult. And you know, a lot of people find it difficult, and you were with me when I told the story. One of the <coughs> great things I learned as a youngster reading a magazine, it's gone, probably gone out of business, called Sports Illustrated. You may have heard of a fighter, he was called Muhammad Ali, at that time he was called Cassius Clay. I don't know, fighting may not be a big thing. But anyway, he was fighting the existing world championship uh, against Sonny Liston in Lewiston, Maine. And Sonny Liston was called the Big Bear, and he was a massive guy. And here was Cassius Clay at the time, young guy, 21 years old or so, out of Louisville, Kentucky. And they were interviewing his lawyer, and they said, why did you think you could take this unknown fighter, this kid, Cassius Clay, and demand a 400000 which was big money back then, guarantee for him to fight the world champion, Sonny Liston? And the lawyer answered the reporter, you know, the problem is not asking for 400000 it's whether or not you stutter when you ask. And the real, the real truth is that in our communities, people know things cost money. They actually don't understand something that's for free. You probably, I would challenge you, if you really told the truth, have to explain to some people why you're not charging. 